your high school experience should not be like mine. Your high school experience should never be like mine. This can be used as a reflection for post-high school students, the majority of us, and goal setting for primary school students on their way to high school. Your high school experience should not be like mine. For a personal and immediate gathering of survey results, I would like for everyone to participate in this next activity. This is the beginning of session 101, Was the Education System Broken in Your Area? Administered by yours truly. <laughs> the criteria. I'm gonna say five statements. For each statement, if you can relate, just raise your hand. And please, please, don't be shy. A forewarn, statement three might trigger some of you, and statement five might make you feel uncomfortable. But don't worry, because that's the goal. So let's get, set, let's get started. Statement one, a rainy morning. On your way to school, a car drives beside you and splashes water all over your body. You're soaked from head to toe, and you're cursing the world, wishing you had just stayed home. Who can relate? Let's see the hands. OK, not many, but still a good number. OK, let's move on. Statement two. You walk into your classroom dreading to get the day started. You're praying that it'll be a good day. You're sitting in your chair, waiting for your teacher to show up, but they never do. And you're elated, you're ecstatic. But instead, you get a substitute. Or worse, the principal sitting in your class. Who can relate? Okay, a lot more than the last one, which is slowly showing progress. Awesome. All right, statement three. It's Valentine's Day. Now, with or without the presence of a school-sponsored event, you write up a note or plan a confession to give to your high school crush. You work up the nerve during the day's break and let them know how you feel, regardless of the outcome. Who can relate? Okay, not as, not as many, but there's still young love, which is fantastic. <laughs> and for those who did, hopefully it was a good response, and if not, you don't have to worry about that anymore. We're way past that. So, Statement four, you're late for school. You burst through the doors, sweat dripping and breath stolen by physical activity. You're hoping you'll be able to get to class without being noticed, all for naught. You're seen and get sent to an office where you're either scolded or written up with detention to come soon after. Who can relate? Okay, still not as many, but good enough. All right, and statement five, this one might be a little heavy, so just be prepared. You head to school and realize that your building cannot afford to stay within its current location and is threatened to be shut down and or relocated. All the while, schools across the city are being recognized and closed for the presence of asbestos, for exposure to this substance can lead to the development of several cancers and diseases. All of this comes from very few safety checks and building structures that haven't been renovated in the last 30 years. So, who can relate? Yes, awesome. Okay, thank you for participating. Now, I'm pretty sure that we all understand the correlation between these statements and the frequency of us raising our hands. Uh, the last one was a bit of a twister at the end and I apologize for leading you on, but remember, that was supposed to make you feel uncomfortable. And I think I did a good job. Joelle Spring, an American academic, educator, and known author of a number of academic textbooks that we all despise spending money on, gave us the quote. Human rights includes political, social, and economic rights, and imposes an obligation on all human beings to protect the rights of others. This is a moral code that advocates hold near and dear to their hearts. We motivate ourselves to do this work because of the impact that it will have on other people. I am my brother's keeper, and I am my sister's keeper. So, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Samuel Dennis, an alumni of Science Leadership Academy, founder, co-founder, and director of a handful of nonprofits across the city of Philadelphia an education and STEM advocate, a current sophomore computer science major at Villanova University, and a product 
of the Philadelphia School District. I don't consider myself a graduate or a degree holder. I'm, I'm just a product. Now, don't get me wrong. I use the term product as a term of endearment. As in, this is the best thing that anyone can be called when they graduate from such a bad educational structure. But it's not all bad. When there are issues within your home, your first instinct, for me, for all of us, is to resolve it. And don't forget, issues are always fixable. As a routine transmission of formalized knowledge, a compulsory public education has existed since the 16th century. We believe that education has ultimately evolved since then. With the rise of urbanization, industrialization, and globalization, even more so, the ever-growing presence of technological ideologies within schools has been an ever-growing factor for intellectual output, gauging a student's technical skills, their knowledge, and their verbal ability. But have we seen improvement since those times? Or are we facing a serious case of presentism? This may come as a surprise, but there is a natural inclination to see the present as more interesting and dynamic, only because it's so immediate and familiar to us. That is presentism. And there's also a tendency to see the future as even better. Now, there are always pessimists among us too, and we're constantly reminded of the dangers that loom on the horizon. But most of us like to believe that progress has been good, and we expect it to continue. The struggle to understand and remove this mindset from our day to day begins here. We can only exit this mindset with events, action, and by example. An arguable beginning of broken education in Philadelphia starts with the 1967 student demonstrations and protest at the School District of Philadelphia headquarters. Now, it's not the 16th century, but it's pretty damn close in context. <laughs> this this had only a fragment of civil unrest within the United States, a time where tensions were through the roof. A 50% graduation rate fell among students at the time. Student mistreatment based on racial backgrounds, a wave of public school closures, and the exposure of racist attributes of a then Philadelphia mayor, Frank Rizzo, which determined the fate of 13,500 students across the district. 13,500 students outside of their classrooms. 3,500 students protesting at main district headquarters, missing classes altogether. 1,000 of them involved in police altercation, 350 students injured, 57 arrested. This, this is maddening. This is the worst case scenario for a student voicing their opinions about injustice to those who won't listen. Shutting down a protest is one thing, but injuries, arrest a criminal, record. There's no doubt that this impacts a student's ability to be, pro be provided with a quality education. But for now, is this okay? Oops. This was the past. We only went through this once. We would never put our students through this again, right? So let's fast forward. Let's fast forward and pinpoint some of the changes along the way. What exactly has happened since 1967? The founding of a government-based district school board. The abolishment of this government-based district school board in exchange for a local board with students, teachers, and parents. 624 overcrowded town halls. The end of the yellow bus program and the beginning of students commuting to school via public transportation. In the years leading to 2017, there have been a number of changes to impact the School District of Philadelphia. So, here's what we'll do. We'll take the chunk of 2017 and 2020 into perspective, and we'll dub that as our present time, which it is. What happened within our present relating to the School District of Philadelphia? Well, more protests. More, pro more student protests. More protests and walkouts exist in these four years than in the past 20 years. Gun violence, Black Lives Matter, climate change, building conditions. Students are still demanding. They're reclaiming their time through action. 
And it seems like the administration, the government, the world is listening. This is a major step up from 1967. But we're still witnessing the unrest of students. We have now tackled on more issues for the students to be wary of. But this is also the beginning of a way to multiply the voices of those affected. In extracurricular in its own right, students move to outside organizations for a platform. Nonprofits, for profits, 501c3 organizations, by student, for student. Organizations have begun to spread like wildfire. Students wondered how they could emit their voices and influence decisions that could affect their education. And it turns out, the educational structures they were sitting in for seven hours a day only acted as a limiter. Students take after-school hours to pack town halls. Students direct messages to the superintendent, pleading with him to either help or resign. Students want a quality and efficient urban education, and they're doing whatever it takes to get it. In 2018, after a series of mass shootings that rattle notable schools in the US, students from all over the country, all over the world, set their sights on marches to change their local gun laws in order to protect their educational structures. About two million people, majority students, left their classrooms to make sure they could return to it safer than ever. Every Philadelphia student during this time had a majority of their students leave their classrooms to participate. In 2019, asbestos presence became very relevant within Philadelphia public schools. With a total of about 131,000 operating public schools in the country, about one-third of them had an asbestos presence. In Philadelphia, this shut down a total of six schools with the dangerous mineral. Students were withdrawn from their schools and classes, either having to take online courses or no courses at all. What did the students do about this? And not just the students who were displaced, what did all students do about this? Well, they flooded a town hall, which were meetings held monthly to overview the previous month and upcoming events. They flooded them so much that the, we had four overflow rooms to preview the main event via live stream. They formed lines to express their emotions to the superintendent spanning past the corridor, up the stairs, and to the front desk. They brought parents, teachers, principals, family, administrators, school police, and government officials to witness this injustice. Students, they're fighters, and they won't take injustice that befalls their brothers and sisters, their best friends, their teachers, their schools, their home. Not all students need us to tell them what to do. They need us to guide them to unveil their leadership. Now, what does this mean for us? I'm not telling everyone in this audience to get a teaching certificate in order to become a better teacher than your personal teaching inspiration. I'm not gonna do that. Not everyone is cut out to be a teacher, but everyone is cut out to teach. I don't know all of the answers, but what I do know is for those of us who are privileged and have a responsibility of leading or supporting schools that serve children in poverty, we must truly lead. And when we're faced with unbelievable challenges, we must stop and ask ourselves, now what? What are we going to do about this? And as we lead, we must never forget that every single one of our students is just a child in their own phases of personal development, often scared by what the world tells them about their futures and what they should be worried about. And no matter what the rest of the world tells them, we should always provide them with hope, our undivided attention, unwavering belief in their potential, consistent expectations, and we must tell them often, if nobody told them that they love them today, remember that we do, and we always will. You don't need to be a teacher to leave an impact on students suffering within a system. You don't need to create organizations to change the direction of educational decisions. You don't need to become the superintendent of schools to restructure the state of education within a district. We need to bolster the students within the world on a path that fits them, prioritizing equity over equality. And as we live our lives, experiencing new things, while the school district of Philadelphia continues to fall apart, we remember the words of Superintendent Dr. William Height. And we hope 
that these words reverberate among the district, as well as the world, to understand the hypocrisy the district allows and the work that still needs to be done by me, by teachers, by students, by parents, by us all. If we cannot and will not invest in our young people and their futures, then we have already decided our own. Thank you.